Hello and welcome. We're inside the Serum Institute, the world's biggest manufacturer of vaccines. Of all the children born in the world, between 60 to 70 of them have at least one of the vaccines produced by this man, Dr. Cyrus Punawala, India's vaccine hero. Welcome to Jabbi Man. Thank you. Your brand is present in 167 countries across the world. That's phenomenal. Explain, what do you think has been key to your success and has helped you take the Serum Institute so far and so deep? High quality vaccine that cannot be not recognized by any uh, recognized uh, agencies such as WHO, UNICEF uh, and World Health Organization. At the same time, the vaccine is being supplied at an average of Indian price of cup of tea. And all the big pharma like Glaxo, Sanofi, Merck are unable to compete. Doctors charge more to administer this vaccine than you charge to produce it. How is it that you're able to produce vaccines at such low cost and are giving such a tough time to all the global uh, pharma majors? We have very low overhead, committed staff, which gives us high rate of production, low rejection. We have bought the state-of-art machine, which can give you 400 vials per minute, and they can inspect any smallest particle so that the rejection is very, very, very minor. How many vaccines do you produce? We are producing about 1.5 billion doses of vaccine. And, and how uh, many you, children consume these vaccines? Between two-thirds and 70% of all children in the world are given at least one shot of one of our vaccines, say measles vaccine, tetanus combination vaccines, worldwide are the most essential vaccines. And these are uh, given to uh, all the underprivileged children, mainly who can't afford the exorbitant price of vaccines that are being supplied by Big Pharma. For Big Pharma, you're an enemy of sorts. Absolutely. And an enemy because they say the Serum Institute and Dr. Punawala take our IPR, these patents that we produce by spending billions of dollars on research. They do no research. They do jugad. They copy our vaccines and they mass produce them at low cost, which is what allows you to take your vaccine so far and deep, but you're essentially being accused of copying their patent and their idea. Now, that's not completely true because they've mulked the public for 20 years with their patent. We can only go for products that are off patent. Secondly, we have made certain research development which has made us have a high quality vaccine but at a low cost by improving the yield and the fruit of R&D. Instead of extracting a higher price and making more profit, we are lowering the price and bending with that to the humanity and the rest of the world. So we are now entering the cold room of the Serum Institute. This is, Dr. Punala, minus 20 degrees now? Yeah, we have different type of cold rooms. Some are 2 to 8 degrees, some are minus 20 degrees. How long does a vaccine last for? Well, if it's in minus 20, it can last up to three to four years, kept well stored. If there's an epidemic, they want 10 million doses somewhere or 20 million. We've got it in stock. What is the quantity of vaccines that are in stock? Three to 400 million doses. This is one of the other bigger advantages that I've inculcated by taking the risk of carrying a high inventory in many vaccines. This is the most important thing of Serum Institute's success in giving vaccines at short notice when there is an epidemic or world uh, crisis. So one of the key things I'm noticing is the level of sanitation that's involved is very, very high. Yeah, we are going even beyond the minimum level because you never know. If you're just working at minimal level that many people are doing, then if something goes wrong, you go below the level, you're gone. The product is either to be destroyed or comes under jeopardy. So we are keeping at least 30 to 50% margin on our storage, on our overfill, on our uh, margins that we keep for safety of the vaccine getting spoiled because of any 
cold room failure and all of that. Very difficult to be in for a long while. I think we should be heading out now. I'm thinking about all those people who spend their time over here. It's obviously not easy being here. We're inside the state-of-the-art manufacturing laboratories of the Serum Institute. We're seeing Dr. Punawale, you're now using a lot of automation. But for all those young people who are watching and wondering if they want to be in this sector, make this their career at a time when machines like that are coming in, where is the space for a young human being? Expansion. That's what our government is even trying to do, create more facilities, more products, more uh, R&D. And one thing I must emphasize, this is not a labor-saving thing. This is a sterility, quality control, uh, issue where there is no human intervention which is very essential for a product. No human being at any level comes in direct proximity with the vaccine which is why you're, yeah. you know, you've got these gloves into which people put their hands. Yes, this is called a barrier maintained uh, filling area where only you can put in your hand and use the fingers to manipulate uh, whatever you have to do there. There is no question of any breath or anything coming in the way. How much of an effort are you making as a vaccine major in doing your own R&D? To make in India, create in India, develop in India? Make in India is the vaccine itself. Fundamental research, I don't believe in it, we are too far behind. Applied research, that means there is a certain system that's going on in Europe. We can't apply it to India because of so many shortcomings. That is the research we are doing to dovetail the two Indian requirements international knowledge married together to give us the right results. But why not fundamental research? Where you that will take too long, we have many years behind and it will be too expensive. But should that at some point in time not be a priority for Indian then manufacturers take, then to we'll, look at? Th that will be too far behind. I would think the better way is to take a shortcut and get on with it and deliver the goods so we can internationally grow in our exports and availability of uh, Make in India products, instead of trying to do Make in India research products, that will be too far. I am not for it. Dr. Punawala, one of the things I want to understand from you is, if uh, in India we can produce vaccines at such scale, at such low cost, why is it that infant mortality in India hasn't yet come down to the levels in Western countries? That's because the government of India is the only body that can make uh, this possible by buying the and procuring the vaccines. Up till now, they didn't have a budget. For example, the measles and rubella vaccine, polio vaccine, that were not affordable even to at price of five and ten rupees, even the poor people couldn't take it. Because they don't have water in the villages. Where is the question of them buying a vaccine? The Modi government has moved one step forward. This year, for example, they bought 250 million doses of this MR vaccine and gave it free to everybody. So all children in India would be protected. What is it that you think we need to do further to be able to ensure that diseases that are completely preventable for which vaccines exist yes. are not killing young kids in India? The only solution is, A, you have to have enough uh, high quality production facility, which serum is issued proudly says we can deliver enough for the world, leave alone India. Second is the budget. They don't have the money to buy such large quantities of vaccines and uh, vaccinate the poor people. Now, it doesn't mean that the health ministry cannot afford to buy the vaccine, but their difficulty is that they have to have enough midwives and doctors to administer the vaccine. This cost is even much more than even buying vaccines. Dr. Punawala, in this segment of the show, I want to understand from you what you think life has taught you about success and failure. Lessons that can be learned by other young people who are starting out and wondering how they can succeed and be like you. One of it is to hit upon the right uh, combination which will make you drive uh, your uh, motive of what you want to do in life. And then you have to work night and day to see that that succeeds without imagining things will happen on its own. Dr. Punawala, were there moments in your life when you thought that your whole idea is falling apart? 
that the grand vision that you had for yourself no, as a young no, man. No, that was that is something I never faced. Uh -huh. There were a lot of challenges. This little place that where I first laid the foundation with the capital of only five lakhs of rupees, half of which which I had borrowed. We couldn't get power. We couldn't get water supply, clean water. Uh, we couldn't get planning permissions. With Modi ji and his government are trying to uh, make uh, what they say ease of doing business. But ease of doing business is one thing to talk on television and another thing on the ground. Months and months and years go to get permissions. This little cabin I worked for five years. This is the room where you started your yes, business yes. empire from. Yeah. The first product I produced, the health minister was gracious enough to come here, receive it and encourage us. Mr. R.K. Karilkar, who was one of my mentors. How have you seen this entrepreneurial journey in terms of just being able to operate as a businessman? First 25 years was really challenging. Then once we got the money power and the right staff to help us to make applications, to go to Delhi, to fall at the feet of the bureaucrats, and I'm using this word which I, I, I believe is still there, and the bureaucrats, if they're not uh, sort of uh, looked after, uh, uh, the permissions are still very, very slow. All the bureaucrats in Delhi Health Ministry say, ah, Serum Institute, it's a wonderful company, we can trust them, let's clear their vaccine and their applications quicker. And that is a confidence that any manufacturer needs to give to his uh, nodal authority to convince that when you go with an application, he doesn't look at you with a jaundice eye, but looks at you with recognition. And this is where many industries have now grown and are growing much faster. The one thing that I find fascinating is that you and NCP Supremo Sharad Pawar went to the same college Bri together. Brian Maharashtra College of Commerce. Who was the better student? <laughs> Both were almost dropouts. That's uh, in fact a picture. My son Adar was only 10 years old. That's Sharad Pawar there? Yeah. You ever thought about uh, joining politics? We no. have lots of sports people going into politics. What we don't see enough is businessmen and industrialists. Yeah, because it's, there are two reasons. We cannot uh, exaggerate and lie. <laughs> and the second reason is that uh, people look at industrialists with a jaundice eye. They don't believe that we could uh, be socially good to do uh, upliftment of the underprivileged. We have an edge, but it's impossible uh, in our country. Take, for example, when 25 years ago, a man like Naval Tata lost the elections. There are 167 countries Correct, you yes. supply to a red somewhere? Yes, that's how we are coming to this unmatched figure of almost 70% of all children born in the world using at least one or more doses of our vaccines produced. Dr. Poonawala, as somebody who spent five decades in the Indian healthcare sector, I'm keen on knowing your thoughts on how to improve healthcare in India. Our budget for health is very, very low percentage and that government recognizes that as one of the major problems and obstacles. Unless you have money, you can't buy vaccines, you can't have healthcare workers to protect your people. So this, uh, Dr. Punawala, was the first uh, building where you started manufacturing from? These three buildings were where we first started and manufactured tetanus vaccine. That was our first product. This just to give you an idea what serum looked like 40 years ago. The one thing I find very fascinating, Dr. Poonawala, is that there are two facets to your personality. There is the work that you do in the philanthropic space, trying to clean up Pune, trying to manufacture these low-cost vaccines. And then there is the fancy set of wheels, this Rolls Royce. How many of these beauties do you have? Several. That's been my passion even before I started Serum Institute. I built a car when I couldn't afford it. And I wanted to actually... Did it work? It's working even now. Ah and we kept it as a treasured uh, uh, memory. Are you going to take us on a spin on this? Why not? Come.
one of the things that most other corporates did at a similar stage in your evolution is that they took money from the markets, they went public. Yes. You have consciously decided not to do that. I could have grown much faster in, than the 50 years, but I didn't want to uh, remain uh, accountable. I would not, as the CMD of Serum Institute of India Limited, public, be able to build up an inventory of half a billion or billion uh, doses of vaccine and just keep them without an uh, order book. It's an unprofessional way of uh, running a business. It was just my gut feeling, my courage and vision. When there is an epidemic, you need the vaccine. By the time you place an order and nine months later, the disease is already either killed so many millions of people or it's not required. What's the 5-10 year roadmap from here? We are going to become more of a global company. We have bought a plant in uh, Holland. This will break the barrier or the stigma of vaccines from an Indian company going into European children and American children. So these are all the global degrees you've been getting, the doctorates that you've been awarded. This is the latest one where uh, an exceptional award was given for Doctor of Science to me. Even in spite of me being a commerce graduate, I have been bestowed this honor. This award by Gavi, that's the Global Vaccine uh, Alliance, which de de declared me as the vaccine hero of the world. I see that's a beautiful view to have, overlooking uh, the stud farms. That's really where uh, your family started out from. Yes, we were giving these discarded resources and breeding stock to a world-famous laboratory called Hapkin Institute in Bombay to make Sira. And that's how one of the doctors suggested, since you got the land, you got the horses, all you need to put up a processing plant. And that was the beginning of the success story of Sira Institute. What do you believe is most important to succeed? First of all, you have to make the right decisions, which is the uh, most difficult part. Secondly, that one needs to be completely hands-on. You can have dedicated staff like we got in Serum, which has really helped me to grow. Hi, Adar. Hi, nice to see you, Rahul. Welcome. Nice to have you with us in Job We Met again. Thank you for having me. What are the lessons you've tried to inculcate into Adar uh, in terms of how you'd like him to take the business forward? First, I suppose, is to keep the flock together and reward them accordingly. Adar, I want to flip that question and ask you, what are the key things that you've learned from your father? One of the areas was focus in maintaining your integrity, and not compromising on your ethics and your principles, no matter what, you know, is, is on the table and on offer. To what extent are you aligned in the styles of functioning and to, ext to what extent do you have like furious face-offs? If there's fraud, if there's incompetence, I take action. But I, on the other side, also re reward equally and generously. This is something my father was always a bit soft on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people took advantage of him back in the day, and now he realizes that he could have put his foot down and been a little more stringent. Running Serum, where I could have been taking a much tougher line, disciplinary-wise, I've uh, carried the people with me by being soft. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest benefit of me being soft is other himself. <laughs> He's a great performer, but I've been soft by giving him a free hand to do a lot of things uh, and take things for, uh, especially in newer vaccines. Amongst the changes that he's making, what is it that you like and what is it that you don't like? Serum could have grown much more. For example, a uh, vaccine price is put at 50 rupees and we are supplying at 15 rupees. Mm -hmm. The difference is pocketed by the trade and the doctors, but we felt it was unethical, both he and I, and we're following this policy that the end, that is the patient, why should he not get the benefit of our low price? In your estimate, how many children's lives would have been saved because of the vaccines that they've had, till now, all of them together? We have data that in excess of 30 million children's lives have been saved. The most significant thing that I cherish in my heart is that in our case, those children which I have saved because of giving a low-cost vaccine, 
is because they didn't have any vaccine. Big Pharma was wanting $5, I'm giving them at 50 cents. More than a million children worldwide were dying of measles. The death rate has come down to less than 70,000 children per year. Great, thank you very much for lunch. I think the horses are waiting. Let's go see them. So, Dr. Punawala, yours is one of India's largest stud farms? Yes. We've got three stud farms now. One started by my father and two acquired by my brother and myself, where we got more than 350 horses, including the young stock. Is this a lucrative business at this time or just like a pet passion, a vanity project, or does it still make business Good sense? Good business. Earlier, it was making money and you could plow it back in infrastructure. Now it's an absolute disaster. GST has killed the complete racing industry. Instead of it being termed as a sport or a game of skill, um, it's unfortunately only classified as a, as a gambling activity, which comes under the sin tax. And with that and 28% uh, GST, it's, uh, you know, the crowds have dwindled. Does horse racing have a future in India, Dr. Puna? Doesn't look like it at the moment. My 40 years of hard labor and running the race clubs and breeding horses seems to be going in way. I was reading that your stallions have won virtually all the major derbies. Yes. Uh, How, what's the total number of trophies won? We have won uh, 12 derbies and uh, uh, many other big classic races, about 350, what they call classic races. They are one year old at the moment and they'll be sold at the end of this year and then go to the race course for training into horses. We're on our way currently to the new Serum Institute campus with arguably one of India's most flamboyant businessmen. Is that something other than it's easy with you or do you think that's an image you want to shake and break? No, I don't take that seriously at all. It's just our lifestyle which has been considered flamboyant. We're a family which believes in philanthropy and giving back and helping the underprivileged, providing clean drinking water and those are the things that really give me the joy. <laughs> So this is your baby. This is the new Serum Institute. We'll produce roughly a billion doses of vaccines here. It'll be the largest single campus on the planet for a plethora of vaccines that we've got planned coming uh, to launch uh, to market over the next five years. And uh, we hope to go to Europe and uh, the United States. Now this is something I've never seen. You're building a boardroom and a corporate headquarters inside a commercial airline? It's an Airbus A320. We decided to make a few meeting rooms and uh, lounges inside here as a unique uh, sort of design. So you do do things very differently from the way everybody else does. Do vaccines appeal to you? Are they too boring or do you want to change things, shake things around? Vaccines are my primary focus and passion. The pleasure and satisfaction that one gets from saving and protecting children's lives just can't be substituted. And today there's so much innovation and technology that excites me. We have innovated on various different delivery systems and um, thermostability and changed a lot of things that uh, the traditional vaccines uh, uh, were lacking. The challenge of entering into Europe, Australia and the United States, how do you hope to do it? Well, you know, this campus that you're driving around right now uh, is one of the largest campuses complying to Europe and US uh, standards. Uh, we've got experts from all over the world to help us and uh, our quality standards have always been up to the uh, highest. The real challenge will be when we enter these markets, barriers to entry that have been created by the big pharma and even if you look at what China is do doing to India, 
you know, we can't sell our vaccines there and pharmaceutical products there, but they can dump their products here. And I would uh, uh, plead and request our uh, trade negotiators to try and have a more even playing field when it comes to countries like China that protect their markets, but take full advantage of ours when they want to come and sell their products here. But the flip side to that other is the charge that Big Pharma throws your way, that you're just leaving off their effort. No, that's um, uh, partly incorrect because any way to stay out of the game and make new products, you have to innovate. So these are just arguments made to justify high prices and protecting markets in the developed world, which um, is fine where you can afford it. But when it comes to the poorer countries who can't afford these products and children are just dying because they can't get access to these affordable vaccines and pharmaceuticals, that's really, truly a crime. So Adar, as we drive around Pune, we've seen a lot of these other Punawala clean city initiatives. You've been a big Swachh Bharat ambassador. You know, this is the largest initiative of its kind. As you can see over here, these machines have been bought from Holland and Belgium. They've got giant suction systems to scoop up big piles of garbage. Now we have 250 trucks and machines like this going around the city, covering roughly 450 kilometers of road. What do you think can be taken from the Pune model and replicated elsewhere? Well, you know, firstly, you need high-tech equipment. You can't expect manual scavenging to continue and uh, uh, that for garbage as well. We need more plants all over the country being able to convert that into so electricity. Picking it up? Yes. And, and then taking it outside of the city limits to process it in an energy plant. Well, this is a very interesting uh, experiment. I hope you're planning to scale this up, take it to other cities as well, or this is only where the home is. Well, I hope that other chief ministers and other policy makers, uh, uh, you know, uh, cooperate and join hands in this. Adar, this has been a fascinating day spent with you and Dr. Cyrus Punawala. We wish you all the very best. Thank you for joining me. Thank on you, Thank, Thank you. you.